So welcome to the audience here in the Tardini in Venice. Welcome uh, at home uh, on the screens. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to our wonderful panelists. Uh, my name is Gerald Bast. Uh, I'm proud to be president of the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. The duty of a university is to contribute to the proper development of human societies and natural environments. And the duty of a president of a university is always to ask, are we moving in the right direction and are we doing enough? Actually, I'm convinced that uh, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna is definitely moving in the right direction, but as all universities, of course, it's not enough yet what we are doing. Contributing to the proper development means um, having something in mind to do, having uh, some empathy to human societies, and to our natural environment. And uh, it also means to meet the challenges. And there are a lot of manifold challenges we have to meet, from a climate crisis uh, to radical technologies, from uh, increasing migration to aging societies. And this all, and more of them, is also a matter to architecture. But not only to architecture as a single discipline. If we look at all these uh, challenges, we have to realize that these challenges only can be met with the collaboration of different disciplines, different ideas, different knowledges. And this is what we have to work on in the next years. Uh, we have to, to move on in this direction to find a way how to meet these manifold challenges. Um, I'm really happy to have uh, this panel again. Uh, the Angewandte is kind of a Biennale University, the Biennale University. Uh, in Austria, and uh, we are proud to organize uh, this kind uh, of uh, discussion every year. And this year it's uh, a very special discussion uh, with uh, very special guests and a new kind of setting, including students not only in the audience but on the panel. I'm very much looking forward to uh, uh, what you have to say, and we also have a guest uh, via Zoom. Uh, very warm welcome to you. Uh, and so, let's start. Thank you all. Have uh, an inspiring one and a half uh, hours. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I also want to warmly welcome you um, on behalf of the IOA on this special Saturday within this inspiring context of this year's Venice Biennial. On a personal level, this is a very exceptional moment for my two-in-one professional and geographical lives are converging with colleagues, collaborators, students, and friends from both Austria and Ghana and elsewhere in this city at this Leslie Locos Biennial. I am extremely grateful to you, Gerald, for the invitation and opportunity to curate this event. You wanted to discuss the future of architecture, and to me it was very much in the flow to formulate the pressing question of how to architect alternative futures and beyond. And to invite this group of panelists with whom I felt it would be a thrilling a conversation to reflect on the question and to explore their diverse positions towards it. It's an honor to have the remarkable Hanif Kara and Sam Jacob 
here today. Thank you for being with us. I also want to warmly welcome Mpo Mansipa, I don't know where to look at, <laughs> um, who sadly cannot join us physically today, but we have you on the screen. And very unfortunately, Lina Gottmi needed to leave Venice uh, this morning for a jury meeting in Abu Dhabi. It felt logical to me to involve the youngest generation architecture when talking about the future. Therefore, I decided against an established moderator, but instead selected three amazing students from our institute, from each of our three design studios to navigate the conversation. I'm happy to introduce Adam Sinan to you, who is currently doing his pre-diploma master's project with Hani Rashid. Adam is from Palestine and holds a bachelor's from AABU in Jordan. Then we have Josmi Jen, born in Taiwan, is studying at Studio Lin. Previously, she graduated from the University of Hong Kong. And we have Katharina Sauermann from Studio Dias Morina, Gastia Grinde, who completed her bachelor's at the Technical University Vienna and belongs to the rare species of real Viennese at our institute. <laughs> How to architect um, alternative futures and beyond. The future. With the coupling of the terms decarbonization and decolonization within architectural discourse and practice, Leslie Locker once more managed to basically bring it to the point all the pressing issues of our time and profession by pinning them down in two words in relation. As creatives from within a not at all innocent profession, we are being asked to question its performance in the future in order to tackle the massive challenges of our time which cry for other alternative approaches. How can we, can spatial practices contribute to visionary while at the same time tangible, ecological, technological and decolonized futures from the very local to the planetary and beyond human centered interests? What radically other perspectives and modi operandi do we need to invent and apply? With these questions in mind, my interest for this panel lies in critically talking through and dreaming of architecting as a verb in the near future, questioning its role in the context of a fragile world. Thereby, I believe we will not manage to respond from the perspective of crisis or moral standpoints, but rather by embracing surprise, beauty, connectivity, healing and diversity, and the concept of abundance without any cynicism. The Laboratory. This biennial is titled The Laboratory of the Future. I've been somehow obsessed with the notion of the lab in architectural education <clears throat> and practice since I was given the opportunity to found one at the IOA 12 years ago in, one, in 2011. A lab is per, by definition a facility that provides conditions in which research and experiments in a field of study may be performed a place for testing, observing, and practicing. To come up with another body of knowledge, new approaches, other spaces, and alternative solutions, one needs to engage oneself with the unknown. We need more experimental, speculative approaches in architecture, and we need to unlearn a lot. With the lab environment, it is naturally more about observing and listening than it is about stating and quickly reacting. The verb. Maybe architecture as a noun, standing alone as a given, belongs in the past. We need to concentrate on and take the act of perceiving, thinking, conceptualizing, translating more seriously. Put more of our energy and creativity into the process, not the product. Not for the sake of the process, but rather looped back into our designs, which I think should be more about the design of environments than buildings. The normative models of architectural education and practice need to be hybridized and radically transformed if we are aiming for a new kind of connectivity, a universal discourse with regional cohesion and alternative spatial imaginations. I will stop here um, and hand over to um, Adam, just me and Katharina now. Thank you.
Um, hello, I'm Jasmine, and we will now introduce the three speakers. The first speaker, Hanif Kara, uh, he has contributed 40 plus years of global design experience. He is a co-founder and design director of the International Engineering Practice, AKT2, which is today pioneering an interdisciplinary response to the climate crisis. He is also professor in the practice of architectural technology at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, having previously taught at other design schools throughout the UK and Europe. In 2022, he received the CTBUH Fossler Khan Lifetime Achievement Medal for his contribution to the built environment and was made an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire for services contributed to the fields of architecture, engineering, and education. The second of our speaker is Sam Jacobs. Um, he is principal of Sam Jacobs Studio um, for architecture and design, a practice whose work ranges from urban design through to architecture, design, art, and curation. Sam is interested in how architecture and design make ideas real, socially, formally, and materially. From nightclubs to social housing, community centers to exhibitions, his projects are striking, yet also full of familiar references, creating places and spaces with character and surprising beauty. His work has been shown at institutions such as the Art Institute of Chicago, the MAC Vienna, Victoria and Albert, and the Venice Biennale, where he was co-curator of the British Pavilion 2016. He's a columnist for Art Review and is author of Make It Real, Architecture as Enactment, from Strike Club Press 2012. And previously, Sam was founder of the FAT um, Architecture, and he will be joining the IOA um, community soon. And uh, our third and uh, last uh, panelist is joining us uh, via Zoom. Mfou Matsipa is an educator, researcher, and curator. Mfou was a Loop Fellow at the Graduate School of Design, Harvard University in 2022, and a Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Wortwatersland in South Africa in 2021 and 2022. She received her PhD in architecture from UC Berkeley and has taught at the University of Fort Waters Rand at Col and the Columbia University. She has written critical essays on art and architecture, curated several exhibitions, discursive platforms, conducting experimental architecture research, including for the Venice International Biennale 2008 and 2021. The African Mobilities Exhibition at the Binatec de Moderna in Munich as a chief curator in 2018 and Studio X in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mfo is, is an associate curator for Lubumbashi Biennale in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 2024, and she is working on a publication on African mobili mo mobilities. Her curatorial uh, research interests are located in the intersection of decolonial de urban studies, experimental architecture, and the visual art in the majority world. Thank you, everyone. and. Uh, we would like you to start with uh, the presentations. Thank you, um, Fo, and uh, if we kick it off. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here, inviting me, and all of you for taking some time. Can you hear me at the back? If I turn around, it's because I can't see my slides. but. Uh, to talk about the future, one thing we have to start with is by not dismissing the past. I think there is a, a huge risk when you talk about the future to assume there was no past and there is no present. So I'm going to start from that position and I'm going to say in seven minutes some of the things that I would characterize as that has led us to where we are. The most important thing I want to say is technology got us here and technology will get us out of here in many, many ways. So that's my uh, thesis, in a way. Equally, um, as far as I'm concerned, climate apartheid has existed at the intersection of race, gender, class, geography, and all of those things for millions of years. Not, it's not a recent thing. What's becoming more important is we're beginning to recognize, accept, and do something about it. In that world, I'm pretty confident that even though architecture has lost its center and its purpose, it's also the second thing that will get us out of here. Architecture is probably as important as agriculture in that sense. That said, that's the nice things. 
what do architects look like to me at this point? The dolphin on the top left, which is a very intelligent animal, it only speaks to other dolphins, and unless you learn to speak dolphin, you never understand it. <laughs> to the right is the flying fish, which is another type of architect, and this applies to academy, engineering, profession, all of it, but I'm using the architect as a metaphor. The flying fish tries to do flying and swim, can do neither well. <laughs> and then recently, particularly in the last 20, 25 years that I've had my practice, modified mutant, which is a mixture of the two, and that's technology when we misuse it. It creates whatever you might put into it and spews out something that is completely a mutant. And last of all, which is I think where we've just come out of, is the octopus, which has many hands and it doesn't actually use any of them very well. So this is my starting line. Can I go to the next slide? The other most important thing um, I would say is that the unecological, uh, unequal transaction between the global south and the global north. These are two very important buildings that we have recently done. I'm proud of, extremely proud of both of them. The one on the left with Ursula de Miron a new way of doing housing in central London, new build, in concrete, something that's demonized. And it's probably one of the most important intelligent things that I've seen come out of an architect in the recent times, and you would expect that. In parallel to the right, and you would question both of these towers, I deliberately chose a typology that people are saying we shouldn't be building. Density is an answer to everything in many ways. To the right is a tower in Iraq, which we've been working on for a long time now, just finishing. And you would wonder why I put the two together. Well, one is taking a long time, and it's right in, as you can see, it's the only tower anywhere you can see the whole town. Why is it there? It's to pay back, to heal that country, to give it a new symbol, to give it all the things that I think we as a collective should be thinking about in this misaligned interaction that has happened. Most people would say, why would you do a tower in Iraq? So there's a political reason for that. I'll come back to typology. Next slide, please. So it was described that I'm a, uh, an interdisciplinary designer or uh, an engineer of one type or another. I have been doing this for long enough now for 25 years where I've continually questioned what it is that's uh, causing the problem, and that's been happening both through practice and co uh, through academy, but also taking the risk of saying the things I, I think rather than the things I'm afraid of saying. So I should have started my conversation slightly differently, which I'll come back to. Tools are not innocent. That's the, the downside of technology. Interdisciplinarity today, as you can see in the diagram at the back, which basically describes my office, which is not the octopus, is basically a structural engineering office that engages with many things in order to try and push my own profession and re-engineer and rethink the way we might do architecture and engineering in the future. So in this interdisciplinary and specialization is actually still quite important. You have to understand clearly what interdisciplinary means, which is a whole lecture on its own. Next, please. The probably important thing that you learn, I mean, we, as all of us in Venice will have noticed, you know, we go walk through very narrow alleys and we're getting through very thin spaces. This is what I've seen architecture having to do in order to improve its world. It's lost its position so far that it has these little alleyways and occasionally an architect is successful and could do something interesting. However, they have failed to kind of question the power of technology in the sense that they have allowed technology and, and us and all of us, I say, and material organizations to define realities that are unreal. So this stadium when it was invented and first appeared was probably my generation and the two generations below me, the most important image of the last 20 years because we thought that is the power of technology. It's incredible. Engine structure engineers were just amazed at how wonderful we were. It's also Herzog de Miron. But then the reality of it is when you go back and look at it, the steel that was used in that could wrap around the globe 
five times if it was the size of a belt. So now we only are beginning to realize the mistakes that, that we can make if we're not debating and discussing these things. Next slide, please. The other one that I, I call it naive acceptance and bias rejection, because I think polarity is a real difficult thing in simple terms without getting into trouble. In London, we are now longer either, no, either building new or breaking buildings. Even going through this wonderful experience at the Biennale, I see polar you know, extremes being pulled one way or the other. I think this biasness towards rejecting or kind of naive acceptance of any, anything is terrible. So this slide is about demonizing materials. Concrete will be here in all our lives and forever, despite what everybody's saying. What we have to find is how to use concrete and steel in a better way. So the materials you're looking at here is, uh, are a very simple way of showing how you could do decarbonization, but it's another reality that's being misused in that everyone wants to build with these materials. Last year I did a studio very quickly in Luma for Harvard. We looked at these materials with our students. What you very quickly discover is this is not going to solve the world. We don't have the craft. We don't have enough straw to make our towers. We don't have enough bricks to do X, Y, and Z. So this idea of naively just accepting polarity is a high risk position. And in the future, we need to find a better way of having this conversation rather than just Instagram or headlines. Next. I have one more. So this is my final slide. I think, I mean, I didn't know how to go about it, but I thought, okay, I'll just mention the words inclusive, sustainable, innovative, because this is what comes repeating, repeating all the time. And when we go into any space these days, and I'm very impressed by the work that Liam Young has done here. Everybody's telling us in three years from now we won't exist because AI is going to take over. So the big elephant on the room, suddenly, using an English metaphor, has become AI. And it's like so much of it. Designers, engineers, and architects of the future will need now to re be re-educated and rethink about ways of doing what we do in ways in which we hadn't ever imagined what we should do. But the human is never, ever going to disappear. We'll have to think of ways of going through a process and find a way of working with technology, working with humanity, human technology, uh, human robot conversation, so that we can actually tame all of the elephants in the room if we want to get to the next future. That's almost there. Having said that, the real world, from what I see, and I, I made this note after walking around today, it appears to me that the real world is getting further and further from reality. And for an engineer, that is dangerous. Because most of all, we are scientists, we're technologists who can solve almost anything. If, if we make any mistakes, it's usually we don't ask ourselves why we're doing this. So the why question is what I'm hoping the other two panelists will talk about. Because in trying to rush through this stuff, pedagogically, what I think happens is we race to teaching only about race or about climate or something else, and we will face another problem. So my, in my own opinion, getting reality away from, real from reality, the distance needs to be closed again, so that we can actually teach and rethink pedagogy in a way that I feel is human and I feel can actually save the world. Thank you. Honey, did you use AI to generate that image? Uh, actually, the, I, I twisted it a little bit. I asked for a kangaroo and it gave me the elephant. Well, that's, yeah, maybe. Well, it was the kangaroo in the room. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think, yeah, maybe we can talk about some of those things later, because it's interesting. I think the, the fundamental question, Babel, that you, you've asked is, like, is, is to sort of transform architecture into architecting, so to, to make it into an act um, or a performance or something which happens, so it's a verb. Um, and I think that's... A really interesting way of sort of try to reframe 
what, what it is that we might be involved in, what it is we might be doing, what it is we might be aiming to do. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if anybody has had this reaction, but it's a reaction that people have talked about to, to this um, Biennale, but also to previous Biennales, which is like, where's the buildings? And this often comes from people who maybe are not used to an understanding of architecture as, let's say, a more wider sort of disciplinary idea or a way of investigating the world. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think it is something which is clearly on the agenda. I was talking to um, the, critic, uh, the architecture critic of the FT, who, and last week he'd been um, interviewing Norman Foster at the retrospective Foster has at the Pompidou. And Eddie was here, and he was like, these are two different worlds. So, and if when you're saying things are splitting apart, like, in a sense, absolutely. But that, is, that, is that to do with interests? Is it to do with generations? Is it to do with simply differing or opposing ideas of what architecture might, might what, it, what its role in the world might, might be? Um, I think the Biennale here definitely proposes architecture as a, as a wide form of practice, a way of thinking as, way, as, as much as a way of constructing. Um, but I thought I'd just share with you some thoughts also about the past. Because I think in terms of inventing what futures might be or how we might act or how we might act to imagine futures, it's important to, to look at how that's worked before. Um, so you can see, obviously, here we have uh, Le Corbusier imagining futures. So this is uh, towards a new architecture, which originally, the, the sketch slide was, was, was provisionally titled Architecture or Revolution, when that becomes a chapter, the last chapter of, of that book. And I don't know, I mean, I'm never quite sure how to understand that phrase, because in a sense, he's saying, look, things are fucked up, things are really shit, and if we don't improve things for the lot of people, revolution will come. So it's a kind of salve. Um, it sort of assumes that maybe architecture itself has no politics, that it can follow and produce, manifest, and kind of uh, uh, create worlds, but that the politics comes from somewhere else, which is all well and good if the politics is something you might believe in. And of course, that's becoming maybe more and more problematic. There were, there were times, there have been times when it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's worked in a positive way. But clearly, I think if, if you don't imagine that architecture itself has ideology or politics within it, then how can it resist things which we might think of as being less than optimal, or maybe even damaging to, to the world in, in whatever ways. So I think, for, for me, this is troubling because it denies the politics that architecture has within its own agency. Okay, I'm gonna skip maybe a generation and a half. Uh, Hans Hollein here, uh, oh, oh, next slide, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, everything is architecture. So this is, you know, I think 1968, 1969. Um, and it's an incredible vision, late 60s vision, of, of an idea of what architecture might be. He's sort of rejecting buildings, he's embracing um, consumerism, pleasure, uh, sound, experiences. So all of those old things like bricks and walls and rooms are kind of fall away, at least in this vision. Um, and that you know, architecture could be taking a pill which might have different kinds of effects on your body, but it's certainly... And it, in some ways, you could say, wow, well, this is absolutely fantastic, because suddenly everything is in play as something which can be architected or thought about in an architectural sense. But at the same time, it's a very late 60s vision. It also has no real explicit politics. The politics are kind of implicit, like youth kind of rebellion, I suppose, like a little bit rock and roll um, and a little bit, you know, baby boomer, let's face it. <laughs> but I think what he teaches us is if we can think of the world as architecture, like how 
buildings work, sure. How we arrange furniture, what furniture might be. All of these kinds of things implicitly contain politics and, and ideology. And I think for me this is perhaps the way that we can connect to other past visions of how we can create futures, but reinvigorate them. And it's certainly something that I see across the Biennale and a, a certain type of thinking amongst the, a, a generation of, of architects working across the world. Next slide, please. Because we know the consequences. We know the consequences both of, we could say, like, naive modernism. We know it's naive. But I'm not saying that they were naive, but we have the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit of hindsight that perhaps those, you know, uh, 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 the progression of, of, of the late 60s and early 70s kind of led us to where we are now, which uh, 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 is, is a whole series of, of kind of problems and questions. Um, I'm showing this slide by Turner, Rain, Steam, Speed, because it's a, a, a painting um, which talks even at the really beginning of, of the Industrial Revolution, about the relationship of technology to, to landscape. And I th so I think this is a kind of a question that's been uh, a kind of enmeshed in how we inhabit the world. Could I have the next slide, please? So what might, uh, what, how might we begin to think of architecting the future? Well, I think it's, it's definitely thinking on, the ones, on, on one scale about planetary issues, about climate, about our relationship to uh, 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 everything that, that might be around us, but it's also about the hyper-local, you could say, um, and about how architecture manifests ideas and experiences and expressions of community and sociality, even in this room, this arrangement of chairs, these little stools. You guys over there is a highly uh, politicized, highly ideological construct. Um, and can I have the last, the last slide? Um, and perhaps most of all, perhaps the thing which Le Corbusier, perhaps Hans Hollein, maybe didn't uh, uh, consider so much was our relationship to history. Not history as an academic subject, not history as, you know, Corinthian columns and the Doric, etc. But history is something that we have to kind of account for, uh, something to be reckoned with, the kind of journey that's brought us here, but also something that we have to tell new stories about. Because I think if we don't engage with those histories, we won't be able to architect anything in, in the future. Uh, so it's the presence of the past, to coin a phrase, the first of the architecture biennales, or quite almost the first of the architecture biennales, but not the physicality necessarily of the past, but ideologies, actions, and that perhaps one of the key ways of thinking about the future is how we can reconstruct the past that we've inherited. Thanks. Coming to our third speaker, if the Zoom works. Yeah, yeah the video. Yeah. Hello, my name is Mpo Matipa. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to the Institute of Architecture in Vienna. It's such a privilege to be invited to be in conversation with all of you today. Um, especially as part of the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Laboratory of the Future. My biggest regret is that I will not be able to join you in person. However, I am looking very much forward to the conversation. So my talk begins with a moment of rupture. Um, and in South Africa, successive student pro protests to decolonize the university have called the university in its present form into question, with concerns about the distribution, circulation, and production of knowledge. The uprisings opened questions of sight, specifically how to democratize research and design ecologies beyond the walls of the academy. 
To do this requires a commitment to itineracy and to an iterative process that traverses multiple disciplines, territories, temporalities, and scales. As argued by scholars like Sarah Nuttall in South Africa, the formal institution as a ruin can be productive because knowledge is more distributed and gives rise to the proliferation of knowledge futures. Rather than their narrowing, the distributed university constitutes a different plane of encounters and assemblages in which subjugated knowledges, experiences, identities, conditions of production and co-production, as well as realities, can be accommodated as the bedrock of our survival in a move to constitute a shared world. In other words, the highly centralized university and the art museum has become increasingly untenable. As a researcher, educator, and curator from Africa, I treat Africa as place, as method, and as relation. So over the past decade, I have explored situated practices and resistance to extractivism in digital and material spaces in order to develop analytical and conceptual tools that refuse fixity and singularities and that refuse rendering black landscapes as disposable, unintelligible, and or invisible. I think it goes without saying that this kind of work is hardly ever individual and has also entailed collaborations with a wide range of um, creative thinkers across the African continent and the diaspora through the project African Mobilities. So for me, the project of architecting differently aims to democratize and to create distributive infrastructure that serves multiple publics. But as the margins enter an institution, the struggle continues after the infiltration by way of an ongoing relay with its surrounds. Whereas Gayatri Spiva calls this filiation impure, contaminating, negotiated, bastard, and violent, Fred Moten and Steve Harney invoke the rehearsal and synesthesia as modes of speculative, common intellectual practice that allows us to assess a whole varied alternative history of thought. There are a number of institutions that are already and have been engaged in these impure affiliations and hybrid and alternative practices of emerging the world anew, such as Ashiko, Studio X, Chimurenga, Savvy Contemporary, the 1970s um, Polish idea of flying universities, as well as anti-colonial artistic workshops in Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Kenya, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, and South Africa, to name a few, as well as the model that I deployed for African mobilities three years ago. that was itself a distributed exhibition that brought multiple um, creative practitioners and researchers across Africa and the diaspora in conversation with each other, and a number of public stagings that addressed multiple publics. For me, this, this method of curating is a form of public pedagogy that begins to challenge um, the distinction between what is inside and outside the university. But for now, and more recently, I have been thinking about two maps. On the one hand, we have a map of greenhouse gas emissions caused by fossil fuel burning and land use change. The other is a map of cobalt extraction primarily from the Democratic Republic of Congo with an estimated 3.4 million metric tons of cobalt, a critical mineral that accounts for almost half the world's known supply used in many modern technologies from electric vehicles and computers to household appliances. My interest in this juxtaposition indicated in this image rests on a refusal to disarticulate technological innovation from extractivism and its geographies, which inadvertently wipes the majority world off the map. African artists like Sinzeni Mahasela on the left, Sami Baloji and Jean Mukendi Katambai skillfully suggest a critical version of the world from the bottom of the map. The image of the left belongs to Sinzeni Mahasela from her exhibition Waiting for Gabane at Zaitsmoka in Cape Town. Mahasela's work bespeaks how apartheid and extractivism are not just a wasting of land and bodies, but an embodied and continued mental violation in Johannesburg, South Africa. Whereas Mukendi's work on the right draws, uh, produces artworks and drawings that can be seen as a shorthand 
for the socio-economic disparities related to energy, environment, and the daily restrictions on power faced by many African societies. In Copper Marble in particular, Mukendi's work depicts a reworked map of the KOV mine that exports one of the largest higher grade copper assets in the world, a conductor of electricity at the center of a constellation of Congolese cities, villages, and towns that cannot draw power. These works raise questions about educational institutions' own practices of extraction from the majority world for me. I now move on to hair epistemologies because I regard curatorial practice as an infrastructure of network socialities that are not unlike the African hair braiding salon. These socialities are marked by provisionality, intimacy, and fractal networks that generate their own counter cartographies made of diverse situations, actors, and agents. This kind of ensemble work is iterative too. It constitutes a convergence of disparate technicities and soundings capable of playing the same notes and the same score, and what Abdul Malik Simone calls generating entirely different trajectories or sonic possibilities. These practices of assembly and exchange extend beyond the clearly recognizable forms of space into the surrounds, and they require new frameworks, new tools, and new methods of operation. So one can think about counter institutions, hybrid infrastructures, and diverse archives and practices as sites and circumstances of reparation and a form of imagining social worlds during, after, and against the catastrophe of imperialism, anti-blackness, and extractivism. So architecting from black spaces, for me, is a mode of thinking about spatial justice and architecture beyond the unrepresentability of the majority. More specifically, my model of pedagogy and curatorial practice developed through African mobilities shows how African architecture and African cities could and should inform a number of the, of the devalued spatial imaginaries that could expand the scope of what might constitute imaginable spatial futures and practices. If nothing else, the idea of the laboratory of the future suggests that black landscapes in their multiplicity are already sites of radical possibility, complex temporalities that oscillate between the past and the present, despite our highly uneven access to intellectual, physical, and economic mobility and circulations. So I leave you with four key ideas that the distributed counter institution offers as a way out of epistemic and geographic closure. One, the redistributed university or institution serves as a call for reparations, restitution, and a politics of change, and for a redistributive system. Two, it calls for a curriculum that draws on multiple traditions of thought and making and a critical position on the conditions of production. Three, it calls more for more porosity and an interrogation of inside and outside of the institutions in which knowledge driven by diverse formations, knowledge is less bound by the university and the museum become increasingly uncontainable. And finally, a valorization of intellectual and cultural labor from the surrounds, which are already fragile and weakened by decades of austerity and vicious border regimes. I'll leave it there and I look forward to having um, a conversation in person um, very shortly. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I look forward to the discussion. Bye. This one, all right. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, very much for your wonderful presentations. As a start for our conversation, we would like to point out the framework under which we will structure the next 30 minutes in response to the curatorial statement and in order to find answers for uh, how to architect alternative future. We propose to look at the question through three different lenses. The first one is the adjective, the attitudes, and the attitudes towards framing our approach to architecture. The second should be the noun, the ways in which architecture could manifest. And the third is the verb, concerning the methods and processes involved. So we'd like to start with the, with the attitudes and the framing of architecture. Uh, we'd we'll start with you, Mfo. Thank you for your presentation again. You mentioned in your work 
uh, a lot uh, about you, you talk a lot about the deconstruction of time and you emphasize on that a lot. However, when you're in your in your exhibition, there are you divided divided the outputs or the exhibited pieces into three different categories: the prototypes, speculation, and cartographies. Mm -hmm. So, we would like to just for you to to describe in simple terms which adjectives and attitudes would you like to come to your mind uh, that are crucial for architecting alternative futures. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that um, uh, that there was there was a kind of uh, conceit in, in dividing it into three different categories of circulation, speculative futures, and prototypes, when in fact a lot of these categories um, are quite contaminated and overlap with each other. But I think that um, the question that I'm most interested in, which I think is deeply political, is the one of circulation, uh, which has to do with um, which knowledges, uh, which 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 kinds of knowledges, spatial experiences, and values um, have the privilege of circulation, and which ones do not? Um, so it's an infrastructural question around um, what what knowledges are in circulation, who has access to them, and and how do they gain legitimacy and hegemony in in the universe of architectural discourse and also architectural pedagogy. Thank you, Fo. Um... We jump, the next question would be to uh, Sam. So you speak about architecture, if there is, the options are between architecture and revolution, the, maybe the, our only option is architecture as revolution. So which notions relevant to architecture as a revolution would you call upon, and what does, it, what does this revolution entail? I think something implicit in the, the transformation of uh, architecture into a verb is a challenge to how architecture gets produced, right? Um, now, Hanif, as I'm sure you know, like the professional production of the built environment is, has reached a point where it's all, almost impossible for, you know, um, for, for things outside of, of that vision to ever enter it. It's almost impossible, like for example, I'm trying to make a column out of a tree. You'd have thought, this is simple, right? But because the tree hasn't gone through the process of becoming a, a legitimate piece of building, of, of you know, a, a kind of construction material, we've had to invent a way to prove that a tree can hold up a roof. Like, it's, it's absolutely insane to the point where you think, this is how the world is being produced. And you could say that's you know, surely material, um, with all the associated questions that we now kind of understand about materiality. And, um, uh, but it's even more so in its professional capacity. So this is the thing which basically prohibits who and how who can produce architecture and how it can be produced because of project management, because of risks, because of insurance, because of all of these kinds of, you could say, the sort of cultures of professionalization which surround activities of, of design. And I think that is the greatest inhibitor of, of any kind of change because it absolutely, it's absolutely resistant to it because its main task is to reduce risk, to reduce anything which is un known. And so, you know, how, what can we do about that? I mean, Hanif, in a sense, is suggesting that it's a failure of us architects to convince. And yeah, in a way it is, but it's also an unconvincible thing that we're up against. So one of the, oh, yeah, the, the, the potential to, to reimagine what architecting might be is also an attempt at how you can navigate a world which is already de predefined by these sorts of that professional uh, uh, sort of definitions and uh, so on and so forth. I think that's a clear challenge. And I think th those kinds of professional uh, kind of modes have got, you know, th they're at a point now where nobody, nobody knows what they're there for. Nobody <laughs> <laughs> quite knows why they're there or how they were designed. They're, that, yeah, that we're at a point where we it's very difficult for those, uh, um, those protocols to be, to be challenged. But I think that's absolutely just the most fundamental thing which is kind of uh, 
um, kind of oppressive slash uh, resistant to any form of change whatsoever. Yeah, down with professionalism. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sam. Um, Hanif, in your uh, presentation and your text, um, you speak about architecture moving forward as we need to be more diversified and more nimble. These adjectives that you used, uh, what would you add to it or what would you more elaborate on for us as architects or uh, to collectively move forward? Well, if it was a one word answer, it's control. Get back control because um, if you go back in your own histories as architects, there was a time when you were the client, the constructor, and everything else. And then you became lazy progressively to a point where you gave birth to what Sam just described, which is the profession. So your profession is very different from your discipline. And we have the same problem in, in that we have grown into an a structure. This is why I call ourselves interdisciplinary design engineers. It's very different from um, the way the discipline thinks or my institution thinks. My institution doesn't particularly rate me very highly, but that's okay. I'm not in a race to demolish them. They will end up demolishing themselves. But as we're having the conversation about the future and for you as the next generation, my, my encouragement would be rather than, you know, talk about and protest uh, and uh, argue about things that um, you want to change and assume that this change is going to happen tomorrow, think about it a bit more, try and take control about which bits you can actually change and push forward, take your time in doing it because most protests are about man uh, manifestos, you know, that's what they are. Architecture is not and the way I've always said architecture needs to be thinking of itself more not as what it is for what it does, and that's the difference between the discipline and the profession. That's like manifesting, not manifestos. Yeah. That's actually a really good um, jump to the, next, to the next focus, which we look at architecture as a noun, um, which you started talking about um, already quite well, but um, let's shift it from, from the focus of the adjective, I mean, just reframing that you said um, accessible or um, you mentioned naive, and, but also material or unknown and um, interdisciplinary as, a, as, an, as an adjective. But let's uh, look on the noun of like what is, um, how can we describe of like how architecture manifests um, in the future, but also how would these architectures look like. So I'm um, asking with you, um, starting with you, Sam, you have used very strong nouns in your presentation. Um, you talked about history architectures and um, with politics, um, architecture as revolution. But how could you re elaborate um, on that, uh, that verb with the future manifestation of architecture? Mm. Um, I, I think it's the, yeah, how, uh, 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 how, do you manif how do you manifest? How do you manifest things? Um, how, does, uh, how, do objects, how do objects behave in the world? How do you create objects? What are they for? What, I think some, you know, some of these questions I think are really present in the in the biennial. Like I've been thinking a lot about the objects in the British Pavilion, for example, and about how they have such a strong formal and material presence, but like how they are formed through kind of, let's say, the f the f forces or ideas of culture, to in in terms of how they how they come into the world, but then also how they then perform in the world. And I've, it feels to me like such an interesting way of thinking about like what design is. Like it's, some, it's, a, it's a product of culture and it's a thing which then exerts its own force or center of gravity out in, into the world. But yet it also has such strong material and formal presence. And that feels to me to be a, a, an excellent like uh, definition of, of 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 what design and architecture can do. So I think it's a mistake to walk into the British Pavilion and to look at it as if it's art. I like I've, I feel it's incredibly powerful if you think of it as as architecture, um, even though it might look like a sculpture. But like I think I think that sort of understanding of of maybe objects as adjectives, nouns, and and verbs is is quite an interesting 
thing. Like there are things with vocabularies, there's things with messages, there's things which, which help us understand or help us explore. And I think, yeah, I think that's a, it's been something that's, that, that's been really kind of on my mind since experiencing that, that, those works. Thank you. Um, coming to you, Hanif, um, you mentioned uh, notions of impact, um, but also uh, tools for architecture, um, which will, I mean, to not jump into the discussion of the methods yet, but also what are these, um, what are these nouns that you see um, as a manifestation for architecture in tangible realities, especially you as a structural engineer, um, but still seeing architecture almost like, a, like as a strategy um, in a way? You know, it's difficult to answer because I'm speaking in two languages. I'm thinking in a completely different language, literally, because I'm not an English person, so I don't know the difference between a noun and a verb. Point one. That's, that's exactly the English. Never point two. <laughs> point two is I'm speaking about architecture, which is not my discipline. So I'm really an observer of, of things. So I, I'm not sure whether I can add value to to how um, to respond to whether it's verb or noun, or what you use when. What I can say is that this is already, again, showing a sign of old ways of thinking. Because you're, if we just took the idea of environmentalism and how we're now thinking about it in architecture, it's already, we see that we're separating it from equity, justice, race, and other things. So one of our problems is, even when we try to improve and get better at these things, I, I, my opinion is that we theorize so much, we end up theorizing so much that we forget where it is we're trying to get to. So in my text, when I was talking about tools, I wasn't meaning about AI or digital tools. I think those are a done thing. If, you, if anyone in the room thinks that the digital isn't going to help us, you're, you shouldn't be in architecture. It's going to save the world. Uh, you know, there are very clever ideas. What you've got to know is how to use those tools to get to where you want. But I was also referring to history. I was also referring to you know, how we define what architecture is and what scale. And this is the most amazing thing that, that I've seen about this, this Biennale is that I came with a cynical position, having been in the, in, in the world of architecture for 40 odd years. And I see signs of people thinking differently. But some of that different is disconnected to what needs to happen quickly. What we're missing, I think, is urgency in most of this stuff. And partly it has to do with the tools that have been imposed upon us, the process. The narrative that's come from the West is still looked upon as, even in Africa, I find it all the time. We're still working to the Western narrative. We've been speaking in Western languages. And I, I picked up, I'll just stop here, but I, I had a wonderful moment the other day of witnessing with Babel in a, in a conversation. We were in watching a panel, uh, and Demos Nwuko, who is probably one of the greatest African everything, you know, artist, we were lucky enough to watch him, and at one point he said, first of all, architecture is everything in a rough way, or art, architecture, and design is everything. But the most important thing he said is, the tool is us, the human being. And if we can, his words, if we can learn to dance together again, it'll be fine. And that's where I would come from, is how can we get control, and how can you get control uh, pedagogically, rather than racing to, to demolishing the normative pedagogies, which many universities are doing at the moment. I hear some universities think it's not good to even pin up and, and be criticized for your work, or even discuss the work. That's the direction we're going in. To me, that is the fast way of demolishing um, what some of the good stuff we've done. So for me, it's urgency and dancing together. That's a very beautiful way of framing it. Um, I'd like to talk to Mpo. Um, facing that direction, I guess. Um, you understand uh, in your presentation, we heard a lot about um, conditions of architecture and its current um, roles in um, realities. And uh, talking about narratives, you're also um, uh, thinking of curating as infrastructure and knowledge production and um, speculation 
um, as a way of how architecture manifests. Could you elaborate it a bit of um, a bit more on that as uh, tangible potentials of architecting? <laughs> um, I think that um, part of the way that I think about infrastructure is um, as a kind of social um, infrastructure that allows people to be in conversation with each other. And I'm also very careful and mindful about using the term we, um, because there are very um, specific contextual issues that are underpinned by a whole set of power relations. So it's not clear when one invokes the referent we, whom one is referring to and which interests are being um, advanced. So I think that um, it's hard for me to think about architecture as a noun because so much of that noun has been about enclosure uh, and, re and remaining within safe, um, knowable, intelligible frameworks. And I think that the nouning of architecture is, is something that is very much um, contested um, and possibly part of, part of the conversation or the sets of discourses that are being fomented in Venice at the moment. So, um, so for me, the question of infrastructure is, is really like going back to the question of the referent we being very situated in my own context. So having taught in Africa for um, well over a decade, really understanding the fact that our infrastructures are fragmented and that they need to be new sets of um, of connection, of engagement, and exchange of ideas that aren't always looking to be refracted through northern institutions. So for me, it's very much about recognizing minor knowledges um, and uh, engaging with the multiplicity of discourses, experiences, and politics that produce built environments. And so that is the value of the infrastructural project to enable the circulation of new sets of ideas that don't have to be authorized or um, validated by um, by hegemonic institutions. I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's such an important point, and maybe different, Annie, from what you were saying, is because if you think of the sort of the way that architectural knowledge is produced even in a professional circumstance, as you were describing earlier, is through forms of collaboration. Um, and of course, in some senses, institutions always act to sort of enforce particular ways of working and have hierarchies almost implicitly within them, however much they might want to reinvent those. Um, but I think the ways in which that idea of let's say knowledge production or knowledge sharing or, or the creation of architecture can be thought of as a, as a form of social infrastructure, I think is such a great way to, to think of it because maybe it's not about pinning something up on the wall, maybe it's about another form of engagement or another form of discussion. Not to say that these things can't be interrogated or, or, or considered in a kind of, um, in, a, in, a, you know, in, a, in an incredibly detailed way, and that even you know, ideas can be contested, um, positions can be taken and so on, but perhaps it's the, 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 the ways, the scenarios which allow those kinds of, um, those, those moments to occur can themselves be, be, be rethought. Yeah, exactly, that's jumped into the third um, uh, uh, verb about the methods and processes which we deployed um, for the future of architecture. And my first question goes to you, Hanif, because you have a lot of verbs in your presentation. And you also mentioned um, you are an engineer who specialized, coming from this specialization. And how do you dance together with the, the others? Can you um, elaborate possibly the, the processes? Yeah, I prefer connectivity and interaction to collaboration. I don't actually believe in collaboration, just so we're clear, okay? Because um, I think everybody collaborates all of the time for very little purpose. It, it tends to go that way, sadly. You know, on, on all our projects, we find that, but in conversation. Paul was just talking about infrastructure. 
And if we raise hands in here, in what did everyone think she was talking about in terms of infrastructure, the collaborative answer will be trains and planes. My thinking was really, she's probably hinting at the digital world, because right now we are collaborating, connecting through a whole new AI system between cities, between people. That's another type of infrastructure. So I'm kind of, I'm not inventing new language. All I'm saying is that my pattern of behavior tells me that interaction with specialisms and with thinking, ways of thinking, is far more interesting than collaborating. Because collaborating ten tends to take both disciplines, if we're just talking about two, closer to the floor, usually. And that's what we're seeing has happened to architecture in particular. It's become vanilla, you know, it's, everything looks the same, whichever city you're in, wherever you are. So I, I'm, I'm not so convinced that um, pedagogy can help you to teach interaction and connectivity. But when you look at technology carefully and you start to look under the hood a little bit, you find that technology can help us to interact and connect way better. And if we can get that into the pedagogical systems, the disciplines, the professions, and the institutions, actually we should leave the institutions behind because they'll catch up in 20 years maybe. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and Mfo, um, your research and curatorial projects, there's a strong notion of decolonizing and democratizing uh, spatial practices. And could you elaborate on the mechanisms or systems or processes, how, how you build these social infrastructures to allow more conversation with each other? I think that um, one of the things that is that is difficult and possibly unavoidable is the fact that um, is is like the desire for purity and the impossibility of purity. So my position has always been hybrid, uh, has always been the kind of bastard version that um, uh, that Gayatri Spivak talks about, which is about being able to leverage existing infrastructures in order to to create other spaces. Um, of collaboration. So for me, and in my experience, decolonial spaces or creating conditions for new kinds of conversations to occur are always sporadic, um, very poorly funded, uh, not necessarily continuous, but one has to keep trying over and over and over again. And that's what I mean by an iterative process, that it might look different in each, in each iteration and it might have a different set of actors, but the point is to keep the conversation going. And uh, one of, for me, one of the most enduring images uh, that I've encountered very recently was a tapestry by Faith Ringgold, which is an image from a children's storybook where she shows children flying, uh, which invokes the idea of um, zero gravity, that in some ways the decolonial project is about having a kind of faith in the future and not being entirely clear what the outcomes will be. So none of the work that I've done up until now had any sort of like a priori assumptions about what, what it would be, but rather creating conditions where people can basically jam. So, so I think that for now, I have to um, be at peace with the fact that this is fragmentary work in a, in a system that's quite hydraulic in terms of the power relations that exist and constantly seek out opportunities and avenues for um, encounter. Um, so wherever I am, uh, I try to create conditions in which we can encounter each other. And by we, I mean those who are invested in this project um, and dream together and uh, ideate projects that will be enacted in the future or in the present. So, yeah. And I think that the case studies, very quickly, the case studies or the examples that I showed, like even Chimurenga or uh, Ashiko, were always um, sporadic. And that has to do with what it means to occupy a minor position and to operate from the bottom of the map, where you don't have um, the kinds of funding that Ivy League institutions have, and you have to basically work between the gaps or be slightly off key all the time. So it's a very different kind of logic and temporality and tempo. And I will ask the last very quick question and we will open the questions to the audience. So Sam, um, you believe architecture has the agency to produce political change and what actions did you take? Small p political. Like, um, 
I think it's. I think it's. It, I, mean, I, I, I think in this in this vein, I think it, it, you could think of architecture as a form of social sculpture or the sculpting of the social, um, and I think you know that can take kind of a, 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 any scale um, in any form. I think it's you know it's, it is how you it's how you decorate a room. It's how you arrange the furniture. It's how you serve a meal. It's how you hang out on the street. Like all of these things are implicitly political, and they come. From they come, you know, they're cultural actions, and I think they're at heart. Even though we may spend most of our time, you know, drawing lines on a page or asking people to build, you know, solid walls here and doors there, that really, fundamentally, beyond that, what we're doing is creating the kind of scenarios and settings mm. of of social interaction, um, and that within those interactions is where the real politics of, of architecture, the politics of space, politics of society um, uh, uh, exist. And I think that really fundamentally is what architecture and architecting is, is, is about. We just have to, to manifest that through all of this other stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, at heart, it's, it's that thing, I think. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much um, for uh, the the very great conversation on on, on our end. Um, we would like to open also the questions to the audience. Um. <coughs> Sorry, I've lost my voice a little bit. Um, but um, thank you all for your contributions. The conversation was amazing, um, and I love the themes around, around visioning, maybe world building, um, authorship. Um, that really helped to define where architecture can go. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Give me literally two seconds. Um. <laughs> That's architecting. That's architecting. Yeah, yeah. Great. That's architecting. <laughs> Was it long night last night? A bit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, in terms of like leaving the door open in architecture for yourselves, for other people, I'm a curator, um, strategist, <clears throat> and educator. Um, how can we leave room for informal, informal bodies of knowledge to influence architecture <clears throat> so that you might vision something new? Thank you so much. Who would like to jump on that? Can you repeat the question? How, you want to leave the door open for, to envision something new? Is that the question? Uh, to informal. Yeah, so for Impo also, how can we involve um, informal or encourage informal discussions and inclusions to that, um, that discussion that we have? Oh, is that for me? Oh, okay. <laughs> or I mean, I mean I think... for, for, all, for, for all of us, but I wanted to repeat it in the microphone so you hear it. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Fred Moten's idea and um, Steve Harney's, Steve Harney's idea of the undercommons is really generative in terms of thinking about and beyond um, official forms of knowledge, official notions of theory and, and history. And this idea of gathering um, beyond the university and being in the university but not being of the university um, and engaging with what they describe as the surrounds. So a recognition that, that there are actually cleavages or separations or borders between um, forms of knowledge that are, that are, that are accepted, celebrated, valorized, and those that are not. And so they, 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 they propose a more sort of sensorial engagement. So theorizing through the senses, what are the other ways in which one can um, access knowledge, whether it's through music. So in my um, class at the GSD, I had students who were working on environmental issues and deforestation through biosonification. Um, and it's a different way of engaging with the built environment through listening and thinking about listening as a conceptual practice that then opens up the possibility of sound ecologies. So it's not possible, I think, to simply integrate new knowledges into old frames, but also to ask questions about method, like what are the methods and what are the questions we're asking 
Um, so what are the questions that are being asked and what new methods or what different methods can we introduce in order to open up the possibility of different kinds of propositions? So that's, that's what I'm um, trying to explore in my own practice as an educator and a researcher through um, black counter cartographies by really holding the door open for multiple methods of, of encounter and reading the built environment, um, not only from a human perspective, but also in terms of interspecies entanglements. Do you have something to add yeah, to it? Yeah, I do. Because it's, I, I think the position you're put in often as, as, as an architect is a really weird one, like often by clients, often by clients who you should know better. And they, they sort of think that you're there to give answers to things. And that the questions might be about plumbing or bin stores, <laughs> but often it's about use, how, how spaces are used or whatever. And I, th I think one, one thing, I think the thing I've learned, maybe the thing which has made me more confident as an architect over the years, is that you don't know anything at all. Like, don't know how to build anything, don't know how to win a job, don't know. But most of all, you don't know about projects. And so um, thinking about how you can open up you know, the design process or the, the process of, of manifesting something into the world to other conversations, whether that's through forms of co-design, whether it's through forms of consultation, whether it's forms of just, just through different ways of listening to whoever and whatever might be relevant, in order to, I suppose, build, try to build an understanding. But I think starting from that position of, like, let's say, undoing the, the great sort of professional position of knowledge is a, is a start to say, actually, perhaps we don't know. And I think that, that that's as a sort of starting point for conversations is really helpful. And from there, there's all kinds of ways in which that might occur because, you know, so many projects are all different. People are all different, places are different, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think, yeah, D, in a sense, that's, that's a kind of important aspect of deprofessionalizing oneself, it allows you to engage with the world in a different way. You go to another question. I have a lot to say, but it's better to... Yeah. yeah. We want to get more questions. Well, and if, <clears throat> first of all, I, I liked your uh, picture with the intelligent dolphin. Uh, and I very much uh, like your uh, approach that architecture is kind of not only ideology, but politics. and. Uh, all the people who say, oh, I'm so totally unpolitical, uh, they, they are some kind of uh, suspicious. Uh, they are either naive or dangerous uh, elements in my view. Um, but in actually, no matter if, if you call it collaboration or interaction, uh, the need is to, to communicate. And the problem we have now is uh, we don't have uh, one sort of uh, intelligent dolphins, but we have uh, dozens or even hundreds of intelligent dolphins who don't speak uh, the language of the other dolphins. And that's the recent problem now. Uh, of course, we need uh, experts and professionalists. Of course, uh, we need people who, who can uh, do one thing very best uh, and, of course, we cannot uh, create uh, in the best universities uh, the super generalist. But what we should try is to make people able to communicate in different languages, in a political language, in the language of, a, uh, of an engineer, of a medical doctor, of an architect. And this is the real dangerous situation right now, that we are increasingly unable to communicate with each other. And, and uh, uh, the specialists are creating their own rules. And the best example are the technologists now and the people from uh, the elephant in the room, the AI. They are making, they're breaking all the rules of our lives and they're making their own rules and they don't care. I, it's very shortened like now. Don't know if there are <coughs> uh, people from AI inside. But, but they say, uh, we don't matter. We have 
a machine, we have a technology, and it works, and that's all. That's unpolitical. No, it is political. It is uh, ideology. And we have to see that, and we have to find an answer in our educational institutions and in the professions as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, no, I can come back on that. I think it's you're, you're spot on because when you draw these questions out, and, and the, the only thing I would say is we should not be afraid of the elephants. In, 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 taking back control, I, I, the most interesting and important thing I've ever heard somebody say about architecture is it is life. Architecture is life, and architecture is the highest form of art, if you believe in art. And for me, even with AI, there is a possibility of taking control. And, and that's the, the thing that I think, because we've lost all the communication skills, confidence, and we're even still debating about what it is we are as architects, there is that complete uh, position where AI will take over, and then what? We will all be in a real big mess if that happens. It will happen to an extent. But how can we actually control it and make it do the things that life needs? My, my position is always that architecture doesn't need to be communicated because architecture is a form of communication. In that sense, I would absolutely share like what Hans Hollein was saying in, in the architecture as a form of media. Absolutely, but but it, you know, in a sense, it always has been, and so I would, you know, maybe always even argue that architecture is not really a, a technical act. It's not really about envelope. It's not really about shelter. It's a symbolic. It has a symbolic role, and its symbolic role is perhaps even more important because it that it's through that, through the ways in which we see ourselves and understand ourselves, or 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 use use architecture to kind of manifest new possibilities of the world is, is, is where its sort of real power is. So it's architecture as a form of communication, not something which just needs to be communicated. I, I think I that's I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just reminded idea. of what I think Frampton said in the 60s. Architecture doesn't need a vanguard, it needs a rear guard. And at the moment, the protection you, ha you need to control is where and how fast AI is coming behind you rather than worry too much about other things. Anyway, that's just something from, I think Frampton wrote that in the 70s or something, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do we have other questions in the audience? I'll, I'll run to you. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, um, I have the question, we were talking about like this discussion level and you were saying Hanif was saying um, that we maybe get lost in the discussion too much and forget our like the goal. And I think what I ask myself is like, where's the academic level? Like, what is maybe challenges that uh, have academies to head in the future? And maybe what are these challenges? What is maybe going wrong at the moment and has really a lot to change? Um, yeah, maybe problems. Yeah, maybe first, my question is to Sam, uh, and after to the others. <laughs> uh, I think there's clearly yeah, something, you. there's some issues, things have, things have gone wrong uh, with cert certain uh, ways in which um, education and universities have been working. And it's like, you know, very public uh, scandals. Uh, which involve essentially abuses of power, and I think that becomes through the problems of the institution itself. Um, and I think uh, that that means that thinking about how how they operate is absolutely essential. I think you know a lot of that might be organisational, it might be financial, um, but it's also through how they act. Ex outwards to the world, how they invite the world into them, but also how they talk to each other within, within the institution. So I, I would say the, the old model absolutely has proved itself to be broken. Um, it was pushed to a kind of neoliberal extreme, uh, you know, certainly in the, in the US and the, the UK, almost to the point of 
collapse. Um, and the, it, yeah, the, it, 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 it is obvious it cannot carry on in the way that it has. Um, and so that, yeah, it's incumbent then upon us, in whoever us is, <laughs> or whatever us might be, or whatever the us is might be, to find new ways for an idea of university, an idea of knowledge to be produced and to be shared in different ways and in so, you know perhaps the exciting thing about that is that it might produce new forms of knowledge new forms of ideas about what architecture is or what architecting might be so in that sense the collapse of the old idea of the, of the institution or the university is perhaps the mo one of the most thrilling things that that, that that could be happening right now I, I would just agree with Sam on everything that the uh, the whole no I agree that the, there's a, in answer to your question directly in academy um, there has to be a shift and a major change but unfortunately currently uh, that's been translated into let's demolish everything even in pedagogy and, uh, and that I think is a new kind of danger because what you get is another kind of powerful group that tries to demolish everything we know. So my own, my own opinion on, on academies, you know, if we can first identify what it is humanity needs, then we work around that into how to deliver that. For example, climate. There is very little question that is one of the few massive mega problems that needs all the disciplines. So it is truly transdisciplinary truly done because you cannot solve that problem as an architect or a doctor or whatever it is. And, and there you are, we're faced with one need to solve something and how can we drive all the pedagogies towards that? Thank you very much. Um, I think we will still have time for one more question. Mm. Or, or before you want to answer to that? No. Um, no, I have nothing further to add to. <laughs> then we'll direct the next question to you. <laughs> there. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the amazing conversation up to now. Um, my question is really about moving from intent um, intent to getting something done or intention. Um, there's an English phrase, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And um, there's a big debate about the intensity of the workspace and the intensity of um, academia. And I studied at Angewandte and I can remember being in a, a very friendly space on one hand side but it was also a very competitive space, and it was long hours, you know, working through nights, the whole cliche. Um, I moved away from architecture in like a traditional form, but the intensity of skill, the intensity and being able to deal with intensity in that environment has allowed me to, pro to propel myself forward in very different fields. And I see this, this question of intensity right now, also a lot of people also talking about going from 40 hours down to 25 hours, four days a week, and so on. Given the problems that we have, the problems that you've been debating, the size of history that is a burden, but it's also, of course, um, it's what we're all built on. All of these issues um, in academia, but also in the workspace, how would you, how do you see intensity when it comes down, intensity and um, competitiveness how do you see that if it's about, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and getting something done out of theory? It's a very, very good question. Who would like to take I'm, that first? I'm, I'm happy to answer, at least partly. Uh, first of all, I don't think it should be binary. So mm -hmm. it's not about intense or less intense, in, in my opinion. So you're, you're absolutely right in that some of the ways in which we've all been working in, in competitive environments, tight spaces are, are outmoded and there are other ways that you can take like you have in order to improve that. But equally, to do what we have to do as builders of the world, that's what we're doing. Uh, my own opinion is that you, you struggle 
we said already about collaboration and interaction, to do those things and the speed with which what you're asking for, which is action, to get something done, the speed with which that happens needs people to be together. It has to have it, not without the technology, but I think its intensity is not a, a bad thing. In fact, if you look around the world, we're all actually shying away from it, but hyperconnectivity, hyperdensity in the, in, in, in the Asian world in particular produces a certain kind of intelligence, knowledge, and action, because when you're in demand like that, you, you get on with it. And the last thing to say about that binary approach is we are always still thinking about it from the Western position. Like in London, you know, we, keep, we shouldn't knock buildings down. We should not build ever again. And I said in my text, if you stop building, there's two, billion, two million people in Kibera, in Kenya alone in the slums. So going back to an earlier question, you can't stop building. And in fact, you have to start thinking of the rest of the world. And you soon realize only five or six percent of the world is built by architects. So you have to find ways of doing what you're saying, which is how can we spread and find methods and, and uh, let's call it be more inclusive in the other 90% of the world, which actually builds for itself quite a lot just to survive. So I think it's not a binary situation. I personally, because I'm old, would never imagine a world in which I'll be staying in my loft working forever off Zoom. It's not going to happen. I hope word? that answered some of the question. <laughs> I would like to hand the word to you, Mpo, if you want to say something, You're <laughs> to include you on the screen, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that's, um, that, the, that the demand for, for action and for proof or evidence um, is a kind of privileged position. Like, there is an urgency to the current uh, crisis that's planetary and global. But I think that um, having an understanding that the condition is not universal is part of the work. Of, um, of directing one's energies. So, you know, what is understood as a climate crisis in the global north and the shift to electric cars and solar panels uh, and zero net carbon has actually got devastating impacts for uh, sites of extraction in, in places like Latin America, Africa and Asia. So I think that one has to interrogate the we um, while we're also getting to work. And also I think it's important to um, to think about how to sustain um, the work of, of world building so that one is not sort of like burning oneself out. So how do we construct a way of being human in the world, a way of collaborating, working, learning from each other that's not extractive um, and that also can um, build something in the long term in ways that um, multiple contributors and multiple actors benefit from it. So I think that my question, um, to that question is another question. Um, you know, who's the we and uh, intensity towards what and on whose terms? That's always a question of power. Thank I'd you very much. I'd say there's maybe a difference between intensity and exploitation. The work produced under capitalism or within neoliberal conditions is those conditions are reflected in the way the work is produced and therefore the work that is produced. Um, I think that the, the ways in which we make work is political and that that's also a moment where we can try to, let's say, conduct those moments of world building. So how we configure ourselves as architects or designers or spatial practitioners or whatever it is we might imagine us imagine architecting to be is absolutely key before anything is made who are we and how are we making it i think is a is a fundamental question mm -hmm. so i think we will have to close that conversation uh, quite soon we're already um over time, actually. But uh, I'd like to thank very, very much um, all the panelists. I'd like to bring you the last word. I just want to thank um, you for their amazing conversation, Po, Sam, Hanif, Adam, just me, and Katarina. And 
you, Gerald, um, you, you made all this possible. I thank the audience for joining. And last but not least, I thank Roswitha for having organized the event. And yeah, I, I think this is an amazing biennial and I think it will take some time for all of us to digest whatever we consume, if I may use this awful word. <laughs> thank you.